Hey, Next Economy Now listeners. We're so excited to share with you that we've officially opened registration for our fall cohort of the Next Economy MBA, which begins on September 17th. Our team created this course for listeners like you, the entrepreneurs, artists, community leaders, and other folks on the front lines of the Next Economy movement. Based on our 15 years of experience working with 300 different social enterprises, our nine-month facilitated cohort will provide you with a supportive co-learning community. Together, we'll explore the pitfalls of the business-as-usual economy, explore key business principles from a regenerative and just perspective, all while fostering the community and connection we need to stay resilient, inspired, and motivated in our movement for global change. If this sounds like it might be useful for you or a member of your community, we invite you to join us for one of our upcoming indoor sessions on June 11th, July 23rd, August 8th, or August 20th. Plus, you can save 20% when you register for the course before July 29th. Get started at lifteconomy.com forward slash MBA. Thanks for listening. And now on to the show. Hi, folks. Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. In today's episode of Next Economy Now, I sit down with Autumn Brown, mother, organizer, theologian, artist, facilitator, and worker-owner at Aorta, the Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. As a fellow worker-owned co-op devoted to strengthening movements for social justice, Aorta brings valuable cross-issue experience garnered over 10 years of seeing patterns and common missteps across organizations whose purposes are rooted in racial, gender, economic, environmental, and disability justice, trans and queer liberation, and anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism. My discussion with Autumn revolves around anti-oppressive facilitation for democratic process, the daily decisions we make, whether unconscious or conscious, and some of the assumptions underlying these decisions. Autumn also reflects on the roles of the facilitator and shares some practical advice and techniques for those looking to use this important skill set as a means for furthering systemic change. Tuning in you'll learn some of the key principles of facilitation and why Autumn believes it's a skill set that everyone can and should develop. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Autumn Brown. My guest today is Autumn Brown. It's also the second time Autumn has been on Next Economy Now, the first being in fall of 2019. You know, nothing much has changed since fall 2019, right, Autumn? It's like pretty much the same world, same world, same world. It's like, what is time? <laughs> yeah. So welcome back to the show. 
Thank you. It's good to be back. It's weird to think about the fact that that was fall 2019. It does feel like a distant past, does it not? Yes. A whole new world. A whole new world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe just a quick check-in. I know we did a little bit before, but how are you doing right now? Are you, on a soul level, are you okay? Things are going... <laughs> All right. That's a good question. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I love the I love the are you okay versus like how are you doing because I do think there came a point in the pandemic where asking people how are you felt like almost offensive, you know. <laughs> so I like the question are you okay on a soul level. And I will say so it is May 2021. And for most of 2020, I think I was, I was okay. And for a lot of like the first few months of 2021, I think I really was okay. I was okay in spite of all of the many crises unfolding both in my life and in the, on the globe. And I think that three weeks ago, I would say the week that the verdict in the Chauvin trial was announced here in Minneapolis That same day that the verdict was announced, I learned that a beloved comrade of many years passed away unexpectedly. And it really just took me out in a way that nothing else up to this point in the pandemic universe that we live in now had taken me out. And so I feel like I am just operating in a different zone, like a different soul and mind zone than I'm used to. I feel like for a lot of the pandemic, I was still like high functioning, Sagittarius, getting it done. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I was, I was still going at like 150%. And now I'm nowhere near a hundred percent. I'm really more like 70% probably, you know, and I'm just trying to be gentle with myself about it, you know, just like, I'm not able to track information in the same way that I was. Uh, All the people who are going to be listening to this episode who have been working from home will know what I mean when I say I can't be in a video call and looking at a document at the same time. It just suddenly my brain kind of just like split. (laughs) And now whatever attempt, whatever belief I had in my own capacity for multitasking is just like, this is not happening anymore. So I'm slowing down. I think I'm finally slowing down. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. How are you? I'm okay. Um, Surviving, I guess, I think similar to you, there was a lot of like, this will be okay, damn it, like (laughs) energy in 2020, just because it was survival mode. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty with the progress that's been made on things like racial justice and dismantling white supremacy. And there's, but there's also questions of like what's happening. You know, there's sort of like the business as usual, like culture is sort of like a little bit in the backlash of of that, like of the movement. And it feels like the pandemic is, is lifting, but then there's just sort of like the global vaccine situation with just, I actually didn't know how bad it was with, you know, rich countries getting only a couple of weeks ago, I found out. So yeah, I think yeah. it's like it's really in a bad. microcosm. It's really, really bad. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. In a microcosm, I'm okay. And then I'm also like not okay. So I'm here with you. Let's put it that way. Yes. Here we are. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like that song, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. <laughs> I feel like that's like the, that's the song of this moment. <laughs> yes. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, for listeners, Autumn and I spoke a little bit before this, you know, last time we spoke about the solidarity economy, worker co-ops, and sort of what does it look like to build a new economy based on yeah solidarity economics. So if folks are interested, I recommend checking out that episode from fall of 2019. I believe it's September 2019. And today we thought about talking about anti-oppressive facilitation for democratic process which sounds super cool. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) Autumn is an expert in anti-oppressive facilitation. So I think that maybe folks may be like, why are you talking about that on this podcast? Like, that's cool. But could you give folks a little bit of framing of like, 
why is this an important topic and why, you know, why is it important for folks to devote time to this? Yeah, it's actually a really legitimate question, I think. What does something as specific as facilitating group decision making have to do with our economic conditions broadly and how we want them to be different? What I would say is humans are making decisions all the time, all the time. We are making decisions all the time. We're actually making decisions in partnership with other people all the time in tangible and intangible ways, you know, and oftentimes we're neither aware that we're making decisions, nor are we aware of the assumptions that underlie how we make those decisions with others, right? Or the process that we're using. And so that means if we're not aware of it, we don't have an opportunity to practice doing it differently or trying to be more democratic. And even though we live in a quote unquote, in the US, in the US context, we, we live in a quote unquote democracy. Most people who are paying close attention to the way our political system works understand that it is actually, it's not a, a democracy. Fundamentally, you know, just thinking about what definitions of democracy versus republic, those kinds of things, it's, it's fundamentally not a democratic system, which means that we also, in a U.S. context, we operate in this weird sphere of like using the language of democracy to describe something that is not actually democratic. And that that has its own set of dangers if we think that we're practicing democracy, but we're not. So then that, I think, leads into the why. Why talk about facilitation? Well, facilitation is the process I mean, facilitation itself, right? The word means to make easy, to make something easier. (laughs) And so you can facilitate a lot of things, but facilitation in terms of what you and I are here to talk about is referring specifically to the skill of helping a group of people practice democratically together and make decisions. And it's often deployed as a skill set specifically inside of social movements movements for solidarity economy, spaces where people are actively trying to change the conditions of the world around them. And so the argument for learning the skill and practicing the skill of facilitation is that we actually need, you know, because we're living in a a fake democracy, (laughs) we have to bring a lot of attention and awareness to the actual practice of democracy and having someone whose job it is to facilitate people making a decision together makes the work of democratic practice more obvious and transparent. And a big part of what facilitators end up focusing on, or I guess this is my my personal bias, what I would hope facilitators are focusing on is consent and how people know that they are consenting to things and how you how you get a group of people to consent together. And that's really different than the way a lot of decision-making happens in our lives, which sometimes can feel like this sort of intangible negotiation where people aren't necessarily like actually naming what they want (laughs) or getting to ask for it and know that that need is going to be met. So facilitation just makes all of that visible. And I think it's really transformative and revolutionary. Can you give folks a little bit of your arc? Like, how did you come to seeing facilitation as so important? Like, what experiences led you to sort of say, like, this is something I want to focus on? I feel like I have a funny history of how I entered into facilitation because the way that I fell in love with it was because I was dropped into a situation where I was asked to facilitate and didn't know what I was doing and then did it really poorly. And (laughs) so... I was in college at the time. I went to a college in the Northeast of the U.S., this college called Sarah Lawrence. But I also did my, I did a study abroad year at Oxford University. And while I was at Oxford, I got really deeply involved in student organizing there. And it's a very international community and very multiracial community in Oxford. Because of being there, I was introduced to all kinds of 
political practices and ways of being and ways of understanding the world and political worldviews that I would never have been introduced to had I stayed in the U.S. throughout my college education, I think. So it was a huge gift. And I remember just showing up to a, a student organizing meeting. I think there, it was, I think it was a group that was organizing an action against Madeleine Albright, who was like coming to the university to speak. And we thought we were so cute because we called ourselves Oxford students against Madeleine Albright, Osama, um, <laughs> which at the time felt like really radical. Anyway, so I showed up at this meeting. Whoever was supposed to facilitate wasn't wasn't able to facilitate. And someone was like, you're an extrovert. <laughs> and Autumn, why don't you do it? And I was like, yeah, I love being the center of attention. Of course I'll do it, you know? And of course, not understanding at all what the skill set was, like what was required. And and I had this really awkward hour and a half of my life where I was trying to hold this meeting, kept trying to guide the group towards the decisions that I felt like were the right ones. There were some more experienced organizers in the room who kept gently correcting my facilitation and <laughs> keeping keeping the group on track to be practicing a more democratic process and less governed by me. And I wouldn't say anyone even directly confronted me for how I was doing it wrong. I just walked out of the building that night and I was like, that was horrible. <laughs> wow. I felt horrible. Why did it feel so horrible? I was like, I just knew that I did it wrong. I could tell that I didn't do it right. And I think it was a month or two later that I had the opportunity to attend a workshop on consensus and facilitation with this UK based group called Seeds for Change. That was It was like a flower opening inside my brain. I was like, oh my God, it's about listening, (laughs) you know? And that was the place where I really got introduced to the skill set that goes with facilitation, like what makes facilitation work or, or what makes it effective. And I didn't grow up in a family of like quiet listeners. It wasn't a skill set that was like prized in my household. (laughs) I love my family, but we are not like, that's not, we're not great listeners. Like the Browns, we're not great listeners. Um, (laughs) And any one of us will tell you that. So I just remember deciding, I was like, I'm going to get really good at this. I'm going to become a good listener. Like, I want to learn how to do this. And as I honed the skill inside myself, I found that I actually am a really great facilitator. And it gave me a purpose in movements. Because I was doing, I did a lot of organizing. I was organizing all through my 20s, but I always preferred supporting organizers over being an organizer myself. So I I think that was the other draw for me is that because of the way my brain works and because of the fact that I have like a special skill set for pattern recognition, facilitation is a great place for me to be supporting social justice work because I can be in a room and recognize and hold awareness of bigger patterns on behalf of the group so that folks can just be doing their own work inside of the space and not have to worry about that. I believe that anyone can and should develop the skill set of facilitation. I don't think that it's one of those skill sets that should be held by just a few people And I think everyone benefits from learning how to listen and how to recognize patterns and how to support people to come to consensus, right? Like we all benefit from knowing those skills. And I think it's also cool for there to be certain people in our social movements or in our economies who have a particular gift for it and are given that role to hold because the the more that we can hone our skills the better the practices for everyone. And, the you know, we want people to experience a democratic practice as something that's beautiful and pleasurable. And I think when it's well facilitated, a democratic process can feel amazing. <laughs> it's, it's when it's not well facilitated that it feels like a shit show nightmare, you know. 
we've all been in not maybe not everyone who's listening, but but those of us who've been in democratic organizations know what it's like to be in a democratic decision making process that's not well held and it does feel like a nightmare. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So for folks who are listening, they're like, okay, there's something that I might be facilitating in the next near future. So like what should I know? How do you sort of explain to folks some of the key principles that they should like keep in mind as they're approaching something they're going to facilitate? Well, that's a great question. I think a couple of things come to mind, no particular order. I mean, or the order I'm about to say them in doesn't matter. (laughs) One is that it is true that the key skill set of facilitation is listening. And the way that I will sometimes say it is presence over prep, right? That your ability to and willingness, frankly, to listen for understanding about what's happening in the room actually matters a lot more than what level of information you have going in to the meeting, I think. That isn't to say that preparation isn't important. <laughs> you know, I think preparation is important, but but ultimately what happens in the room and the process that unfolds between people is almost as important as any information that they're bringing in, right? One of the things that I often say in my consensus trainings is the more decisions we make together, the more decisions we have to make together. It's cyclical. How people experience the space is so important and how they experience the relationships that they have inside the space, whether they feel heard or not, whether they feel like their opinions are honored. That is so important. So that's why I always say to facilitators who are, who are new to the work that so much of your preparation is actually about grounding yourself. Like there's, there's creating an agenda. That's good to have. It makes people feel more secure usually when they know what's going to happen over the course of a meeting, right? <laughs> Agendas are great. Having some baseline awareness and understanding of the subject matter is important. All those things are important. But I do think that having personal, internal practices for grounding oneself to the extent that you can then feel and experience other people's energy without feeling like that is about you, that's kind of more important. So my dear friend, comrade, and colleague, Marie's Mitchell Brody, and I for many years have facilitated this workshop called Holding Space, Anti-Oppression Facilitation. One of the things that we always talk about in that workshop is that a lot of people think of the role of the facilitator as like, the facilitator is thinking about the process by which the decision is being made so that the group can just be thinking about the content. And what we say about facilitation is that the process kind of is the content, actually. <laughs> right? It's like the way people are engaging with each other is what's happening, it kind of regardless of what they're talking about. So that's why it's really important as a facilitator to kind of be able to have your ego out of the way and not be so worried about how people are perceiving you and whether they like you and whether you're doing it right. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to kind of slide that out of the way and be tuning into the way people are in relationship with each other. So it's kind of spiritual work, to be honest. There, there's that. That's the spiritual side of the work, right? But then there are really good tricks, right? For like, <laughs> just how do you set it up so that it goes well? And to me, a lot of that stuff falls more in the realm of access. That one of the most important jobs the facilitator has is ensuring that the meeting, gathering, training, like whatever the situation is, that it's accessible to everyone. And another one of the things that Marie's and I talk about a lot is accessibility and disability justice. And we say all the time, like anyone who's working in the realm of disability justice, we talk about how just like access is magic. It creates more magic the more people who are able to access the space. 
And access can look like a lot of things. You know, it can look like when you're in a virtual Zoom meeting space, ensuring that there's a good captioning service so that there's captions running during the meeting. It can look like ensuring that there's language interpretation or ASL services provided for anyone who may need them. It can also look like some of some more of the intangibles, right? Like naming at the front end of a meeting that, again, I'm thinking in a virtual context because that's how so many of us are meeting right now. Like naming at the front end, like here are the times when it's going to be important for people's videos to be on. And here's why. And then here is the stretch of time in which if you need your video off, it's fine, you know, you know, ensuring that people feel like they can sort of show up as their whole selves or have some layer of protection if they need it. But then when we're thinking about coming together in person, it's thinking about the physical space, the accessibility of the physical space itself. Are there all gender bathrooms? Is it a wheelchair accessible space? How many people are you trying to fit inside the physical space? And are you, are you trying to fit as many people as possible in the room? Or are you thinking about people's safety? In social movements, we tend to not do a great job with this stuff. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with our own, like, we get caught up in some real scarcity thinking around our resources, our time, our space. And so we cut corners. And every corner that we cut results in someone not being able to be there. You know, someone whose voice really matters. <laughs> and so that, I think increasingly, that is the work of a facilitator to think about how am I maximizing people's ability to participate in this session? And you're never going to get it perfectly right. Like the goal is not perfection, but if you get an opportunity to work with a group repeatedly over time, it's really nice to think about one of your goals as a facilitator being like, I want to get better and better and better at meeting the access needs of this group, really understanding them and meeting them and ensuring that as, as many people as possible are able to participate fully so that all the voices who need to be in the space are here. Can you talk a little about the informal power dynamics and like, you know, the group dynamics of power and privilege, et cetera? Because I think if one is a facilitator and doesn't understand historical systemic power issues, you know, systemic racism, systemic sexism, et cetera. How do those show up? And like, what do you recommend folks do to like handle those? Yeah. Such a good question. Yeah. It's, it's once you become a facilitator or once you start facilitating, I should say, you don't have to become a facilitator to facilitate. Um, <laughs> but once you start facilitating, you start, you start to see both the obvious and the not so obvious ways that power shows up in a room. Of course, living inside of white supremacy, one of the things that, it, you know, it's really been a big part of my, my life and career work to see and understand how whiteness moves inside of spaces. And it's quite fascinating, actually, like, you, like you, just taking more of a clinical orientation to it. It's the socialization for white people around how to be in groups is fascinating. And the way white people will move to exert or guard their power inside of groups, there is a whole set of practices that go with, <laughs> that go with tending to that, right? And supporting white people to like show up differently in a multiracial space. Well, and also just to show up differently with each other. You know what I mean? Because it's not like the same behaviors that white people will bring into a space that are harmful to people of color. They're also harmful to other white people. You know, it's just harder to see it when it's only white people in the room. So when we're in a multiracial setting, for instance, one of the things that oftentimes we will do as like I, that I would do as a facilitator is use something called weighted stack, where stack referring to the order in which people speak and then weighted stack, meaning that as I'm tracking the order in which people are indicating a desire to speak, I will weight the voices of people of color in the room so that even if a white person indicated that she wanted to speak 
sooner than a woman of color. I'm still going to have the woman of color go first. And if I do that, I always do it transparently with the group. Like I'll name that I'm doing weighted stacks so that it's not a surprise. And it's not very often anymore that I get pushback for those kinds of things. I think it works really well to do that around gender, especially because white men, even really well-meaning white men, have a tendency, I mean, to really want to hold forth. One of the things that I notice, especially in in spaces where people are trying to do like work around equity, liberation, or freedom, that white men will often do the like, now I'm going to do like a grand performance of everything that I don't know and how humble I am. (laughs) And it's like, oh, but you're still holding forth and taking up a lot of space and time. (laughs) Like, and, And as a facilitator, you kind of learn your own techniques for how and when you bring like a skillful confrontation to those kinds of behaviors, right? Because ultimately, anytime a behavior like that is unfolding in a space, there is something being negotiated around power, right? Like there's a way, whether it's a white man, whether, you know, like say we're in a multiracial space and there's a significant variation in class backgrounds, Maybe we're not looking at like white people behaving badly. Maybe we're looking at people with significant class privilege, but who are people of color, but are all, but are coming in with significant wealth and class privilege. Like, I think even in spaces where folks are trying to do solidarity work or they're trying to do liberation work, there is still a tendency to want to negotiate for like, how can I still hold a power position in this space? even if it's just like a social power position, like I don't want to necessarily be the one who gets to make the decision, but I want to be consulted or I just want to be made to feel important, right? I want other people to take care of my feelings while we're doing this, right? That's often how it shows up. Like, so the negotiation for power is like, I just want more attention on my needs, even if I'm not ultimately the one who's like at the front of the room making the decisions. And as a facilitator, you, you learn to see that. You learn to kind of see, oh, I, I see that there's like a, a negotiation and power happening in this space. And you kind of have to decide what is your technique for what I would call skillful confrontation of those kinds of maneuverings, right? So for me, sometimes the more skillful thing to do is to draw someone out of the room and say, hey, This is what I'm seeing. Are you aware of the fact that this is what you're doing? But sometimes the more skillful thing is to bring to bring the conversation into the space for the group to look at it. Because that negotiation, there's multiple people involved in the negotiation, right? So if if you have people who have less social power ceding their power in the space to the people who have more social power. That's as much their problem as it is the person with more class privilege or more race privilege, right? I hope that that makes sense. But I think what I'm trying to get at here is like when we're engaged in democratic practice, one of the things that we have to do is take full responsibility for what's happening in the room. So the the politics of blame don't work inside of a democratic space. You can be as aware as you want to be of everyone's different power and privilege in the room. But at the end of the day, if something different is going to happen, it's going to happen because everyone in the room decided we are all in our agency and power right now making a decision together. And like, I'm a black woman in America. I have every reason not to trust white people, (laughs) right? But if I move from that place, when I'm doing my work, I can't get anything done. I can't constantly be like moving from the place of like, well, I can't trust any of these people and therefore I'm not going to take any risks and I'm not going to be in my power and I'm just going to stand back and like point the finger. Like I have to actually be willing to step into my own power. That's really tender work. So if you're thinking from the facilitator's perspective, it's like, how are you going to support people to feel like they can take that risk of like stepping into their power. How do you invite that level of like shared responsibility, especially in the political conditions we exist in right now when everyone is so like fucking fragile, you know what I mean? (laughs) 
people are very, very emotionally fragile right now. There's a few things that I really loved from your answer around the weighted stack. Such a brilliant idea. I'm definitely going to attribute that to you, but maybe use it <laughs> in, um, in facilitation. It's not my idea. Okay. It's, it's much older than me. It's much older than me. All these ideas like come from who even knows, like probably yeah. anti-nuclear movement in the 70s. Right. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And the, the other idea was around, well, I guess it's a, it's a question is, it seems really risky as the facilitator to bring into the room, like I'm noticing this dynamic is happening as opposed to like pulling that person out. How, how should a person who's maybe thinking about facilitating in the future where that might happen? Is there any sort of tips or ideas around like how to identify mm. when it might be a good time to address it as a group mm. or individually? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I would say that like, I don't mean to skirt the question, but I would say it's usually obvious to me when it's time to bring it into the room, because usually what's happening is people can't do something. Whatever the dynamic is, it's like inhibiting the group from being able to make a decision or to implement a decision. Like when you're doing democratic practice, you know that something's wrong because people can't complete the process. That's how you know you know, maybe they can't reach a decision or maybe they reach a decision, but they don't actually implement it. And they keep having to circle back and relitigate over and over and over again. That to me is usually the sign that like either the group is stuck or there's silence or, you know, like there, it, it usually it comes with a palpable energy that lets you know, oh, I'm not the only one who's noticing this. But if I'm the facilitator, it's my responsibility to be the one who says something, right, to bring it in. And usually the best move is to begin with a question, to name, like, I'm noticing a change in the energy in this group, or I'm noticing silence, or I'm noticing stuckness. What's going on? You know, <laughs> sometimes it can be helpful to directly name, particularly if there's a power dynamic at play, it can be useful to directly name it and to invite people to converse, to, to discuss it. But generally framing things as a question is helpful because if you're wrong, it gives the group an opportunity to articulate something that they wouldn't have articulated without you asking the question in the first place. One of the skill sets that I teach facilitators is the skill of synthesizing information. You're, you're facilitating a conversation and maybe three or four people have spoken and you now need to synthesize the input from those three to four people to help the group reorient to what's happening now. Where, where have we gotten to in the conversation? Maybe we're close to reaching alignment or maybe around a decision, or maybe what's happening is we've identified a place where we have serious disagreement, right? So your job as a facilitator is to synthesize input from multiple places into a statement that you offer back to the group. And one of the things that I always tell facilitators when I'm teaching synthesis is it's totally okay to do it wrong. Because if you synthesize and offer it back to the group and you're incorrect, it's just giving the group an opportunity to, to then synthesize for themselves, right? <laughs> so it's actually a great, it's great if you get it wrong in a way, because then the group can be like, no, 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 that's not, that's not where we are. And then the group is practicing being able to acknowledge who they are, where they are, see themselves. That's a thing that a facilitator can do around a power dynamic is to say like, hmm, We've had a few people speak and here's what I'm noticing. I'm noticing that like the folks with greater wealth and class privilege in our group are feeling this way. And the folks who are from like working class or poor backgrounds seem to be feeling this way. I'm curious about that. What do you all think? You know what I mean? Like if you can frame it back just as like, I'm just, this is information. Let's bring this information into, into the mix. The most important thing that the facilitator has to do is like, like 
oftentimes people make the mistake of thinking that the facilitator is neutral. There's like no such thing as a neutral person on earth, right? So what the facilitator's job really is to be multi-partial. So you're not neutral, you're just partial to everyone in the space, right? So you're, you're wanting to ensure that everyone is receiving your energy, right? And receiving your attention and that you're bringing forward the information, but you're not pretending that the information, that there's any kind of neutrality in the room either. Like the power dynamic is there and you're naming it as it's unfolding instead of being like, well, Alice said this and Samira said this and everyone knows that we just take Alice and Samira's opinions exactly the same level of seriously. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like, sorry, you know, we live in America. So at like, if Alice is a white woman, right. (laughs) And Samira is like an Arab Muslim woman, then like the way their information is going to land in the space will be different. And as a facilitator, it's my job to ensure that the group is not denying the importance of what Samira is offering into the space. Right. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I would love to like, this is I could nerd out on this stuff for hours. I know. <laughs> Me too, obviously. <laughs> so I, maybe one last thing on that that's just coming up for me is just noticing that maybe as white people facilitating space, there may be a tendency, maybe I'll speak for myself. I have noticed a sort of discomfort in like speaking out and naming a particular racial dynamic or something like that because it's like, I don't want to be calling out things like who am I to call it out? But in a way that's almost like relegating the role in a way to like what, what needs to be said is like, I'm noticing the white people are speaking more right now. What's going on. With right. That? It's like, it's <laughs> yeah. like, if you don't call it out, who's going to call it out? You know, right. it's literally, it's literally your job to do it. If you're the facilitator. Now, oftentimes, like, again, going back to recalling my first experience facilitating, if you're fucking up as a facilitator, like you will, usually there's someone in the room who's like, okay, let me help you out, you know, (laughs) but it is part of the journey to get comfortable with that power, the power that the facilitator has to name dynamics because it is, it's an awesome power, which and a great responsibility, right? To be the one to say, here's what it feels like is happening. I think it can be really humbling because you have to, you have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to be wrong. Like 100% as a facilitator, you can't be attached to the rightness of anything that you do. And you have to be willing to adapt based on what's changing in the room, right? Like you might have a whole plan for what the group is supposed to do. And then some shit goes down and you have to adapt your whole plan. It's like, you have to do two things at the same time that maybe seem contradictory. One is get really comfortable with your own power. And two is practice a lot of humility around your role. (laughs) So easy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so easy. Not a big deal. Yeah. Not a big deal. But, you know, on the other hand, it's like, I think if many humans were engaged in that, wouldn't that be nice for our society? <laughs> if we were like, if we were all like, let's spend the next decade getting really comfortable with our own power and then being really humble about our place on earth, that would be a practice right there. That would maybe, maybe ensure our survival. <laughs> You know, one of the things we asked towards the end is, is there anything you need right now from the listeners or anything you'd like to promote? Or, well, for example, I'm, I'm taking one of the Aorta Facilitate for Freedom trainings. Maybe you want to like, right. promo those or yeah. any other offerings? We, or, yeah. Well, I'm wondering, too, because I think the Facilitate for... So Aorta, my, my co-op, we are running these beautiful facilitate for freedom trainings that are like kind of fundamentals of facilitation from, from the way that we practice it, (laughs) but they are so popular. I think that the round that we just announced already is full. (laughs) So hopefully there will be more in the fall. 
Aorta, we are actually about to go into a little bit of like a sleep mode for the summer, which is very exciting. But I will say there is a body of work that I am now developing inside of Aorta called the Whiteness Institute, which is looking at whiteness and how to interrupt at a body level some of the behaviors and conditions that that help whiteness like perpetuate itself and thinking about that as facilitators too. So one of the things that I've been, when people have been asking me lately, like, how can I support your work? And I'm like, well, if you're down to make a donation to a co-op that is not tax deductible, you can totally like send money to Aorta and earmark it for the Whiteness Institute. And then it will support the development of that work. But it is not tax deductible because we are not a nonprofit. Happily, we are proudly not a nonprofit, but that is, you know, that's one of the things, but we do accept donations. So people can give us support to keep developing that work. And likely there will be an intensive training and possibly even a book project that comes out of it. So it's very exciting. Still, we're still in the, in the development phase. So we don't know what all like shapes the work will take, but it feels like an exciting time to be doing this kind of work because folks are, I've been doing work around whiteness and white supremacy for many years, but people have reached a different level of readiness, I think, to be practicing something different inside their bodies. So yeah, it's exciting. Very Yay. exciting. Where, where can folks, website, social media, like anywhere people can follow you or anything? Yeah, so the website for Aorta is aorta.coop c-o-o-p and we're also aorta co-op on instagram so that's the that's the easiest way to find us the other like my other life my other realm is i'm co-host of a podcast called how to survive the end of the world and so folks can f- also just find me there on the podcast, which is like available wherever people listen to podcasts and our handles on Facebook and Instagram or end of the world PC. Yeah. And that's another way that people can support the work that I do. You can also become like a patron of our podcast through patreon.com. And we're, we always, we love when people are like, we like you enough to give you $5 a month, $1 a month. Like all of it is, is beautiful and abundant and generous. I'm, I'm otherwise taking like, I'm personally not on social media as much as I used to be. I'm trying to like basically shift my relationship to digital networks But those are the ways through the internet that one can find me. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Autumn. It's been a pleasure talking and I look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. It was wonderful. It's always wonderful to talk to you. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our past episodes, visit www.lifteconomy.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Once again, thanks for listening.